Okay. It's one o'clock, everybody. So welcome to this month's SolidWorks seminar. What we're going to be talking about today is SolidWorks flow simulation. We have the capable and handsome Mr. Silvio Perez to give you your flow simulation demonstration today. So without further ado, take it away. <clears throat> Thanks, Lars. Um, again, uh, my name is Silvio Perez. I'm the simulation product manager for Hawkridge Systems. Uh, I'm joined today with Gabe Crisologo, who is your technical account manager uh, for Google. And he's kind of uh, the main point of contact for the technical aspect of any questions for SOLIDWORKS related, but work very closely with him in terms of the simulation products as well. So uh, like Lars mentioned, we will be talking about flow simulation, which is one aspect of our analysis tools that you guys have available to you. Uh, it is our computational fluid dynamics tool that allows us to do airflow, pretty much dealing with fluid behavior, right? So that's really the concept for today in terms of dealing with ben uh, general best practices, talking about mesh, and we'll get into a little bit of electronics cooling as well. So this is what the breakdown looks like as far as what you guys have. So you guys have the core flow simulation, which is the items in the orange tiles. So this allows you to do your, you know, pretty much 99% of your CFD applications, which is doing internal external flow. Again, seeing how the air is going to be interacting internally within some sort of volume or externally, if you're doing it, going to do some sort of aero design. Uh, it can account for laminar and turbulent flow. It's a great tool for heat transfer, electronics cooling, just because we are able to account for any fans, any air circulating across your electronics components. And one of the key factors here that Lars wanted me to discuss was rotating components, being able to design maybe different uh, propellers, different blades, uh, and being able to see what the airflow is going to do relative to some certain RPM, okay? So that's gonna be the, the basis of this here. You do have uh, four seats on the network, I believe, of electronics cooling. So it's more adding functionality to your core flow simulation seat, being able to do your general heat transfer, just a little bit more definition that we can define that we'll talk about here a little bit later, okay? So um, usually when I, talk about any type of analysis, uh, you know, more so with whether we're dealing with FEA or CFD, we always want to ask, you know, the basic question of what are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to learn from the analysis? And that will really dictate the direction which you'll take to set up these problems, right? So uh, and it also will lead you into, you know, how to simplify the model, because hopefully if you are currently using CFD or FEA, you are going through some sort of model simplification just because you mo most cases you don't need to define a lot of details there's only a specific area of the model that you may need to uh, really learn from so you can get away from pretty much minimizing your calculation time by minimizing the amount of components that are available within your assembly right and it's also good to really be aware of what limitations and assumptions uh, we have for any study type with CFD, there aren't any really major assumptions that we have. Uh, it's really just your basic fluid flow. But it's really good to be aware of as, where, as far as where the inaccuracies may come from from a real study. And more times than not, it's usually going to be something related to your mesh, the quality of the mesh, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, it could be geometric, you know, so hopefully you guys are handling some good best modeling practices, or it could be just simple human error of defining your, you know, boundary conditions, maybe inputting a, a very bad boundary condition, which is going to give you a bad result. So those are the things to really be aware of in working with flow simulation. Um, so general recommendations, again, there is a lot of because flow simulation is integrated within the SOLIDWORKS tool. SOLIDWORKS has a lot of features that allow you to check whether your geometry is faulty, especially if you're dealing with export of components. So one thing to do beforehand is always run the geometry check to make sure if there's any invalid faces or invalid edges, it will pick up on that. And the reason why we want to check on those items if it detects any faulty faces or edges is just because with any 3D model, it's always going to try to mesh. 
And if it's not able to detect, if SolidWorks doesn't recognize, you know, a specific face, sees it as is faulty, then it may have trouble actually meshing. Therefore, you cannot run. So when you are running or opening up an imported body, hopefully you're running the import diagnostics. You know, usually you want to say yes to that. And then if it does pick up on any issues, it does and an automatic tries to fix the, the issues that it may detect. Or you may have to go a little bit manual and fix them on your own. Um, the other thing here is when you're work, working with an assembly, it's always recommended to check interferences, right? Flow simulation compared to FEA is a little bit more lax in terms of overlapping geometry, but ultimately you want to try to get a, get rid of all any potential interferences that may come up within your assembly. Main reason, again, is because they may have issues in the long run in terms of creating a mesh. So if there's overlapping bodies, sometimes flow simulation doesn't understand what you're trying to do with that overlapping geometry. So hopefully you get rid of those interferences. So, um, and then ultimately overall, we always wanna start off simple in terms of not including or not trying to run a simulation study on your full blown assembly. Again, there might be a lot of details there that are not really necessary that are not gonna play a huge role in the end result, right? So I always recommend starting simple, then add gradually add complexity to your, to your model as you see fit, right? So those are some general recommendations there. Uh, we do have some blogs and videos that we've created that are tied to flow simulation. So if you kind of Google <laughs> uh, search uh, four things to do before a flow simulation study, it should be one of the first links. Uh, there's a blog and there's a video, but ultimately it's looking at these four things. You know, there are options within your, your SOLIDWORKS that you can turn on uh, that make sure you have enabled, but ultimately what I just went over as far as doing a check geometry, checking for that faulty face, checking for interferences is what you wanna go through before you set up a flow simulation uh, project, okay? So one of the main things here, uh, since we are talking about electronics cooling and we are talking about, you know, propellers, uh, we are probably going to be doing two types of flow analysis. And that's one of the main things you really have to be aware of or have to really ask yourself, am I going to consider just the internal or external effects of your analysis? And intern internal analysis really just means you're really just focusing on the fluid behavior of the enclosure that you're throwing at the solver. So like a pipe some sort of electronics cooling potentially, but you're really just saying that any effects or any air that may be happening on the outside of that component doesn't really matter. And the reason why it gives you that option is mainly because it's to reduce the uh, calculation time. So if you don't have to worry about what's happening on the outside, you're really just narrowing the scope of what's happening internally within your volume. Now, it may seem that it's either one or the other, but when you run it as an external analysis, which is intended for propellers, aero design, something like that, air moving uh, outside of your actual 3D model, you're gonna run an external analysis. But an external really means that you can also account for any internal effects as well. So it's your more realistic setting that you would wanna define in a flow simulation project, right? If that's what you wanted to account for. But again, to reduce on mesh size, to reduce on calculation time, depending on what those assumptions are, you may be able to get away with an internal analysis. For your example, if we were uh, talking about, again, fans, propellers, uh, we kind of have to default to an external analysis just because we're seeing how the air is behaving surrounding that model. Okay. When you do create, however, an internal analysis, and this is going to be a little bit more tied to if you create fans inside electronics enclosure, you're really just focusing on the uh, fluid behavior internally of that box, let's say, we have to create what's called lids. And that's what you're looking at here in the image of this electronic box. That blue region is your fluid domain. So any opening that you may have where it's perforated plate or you know any venting that you may have within your box, we have to cover up cover that up with a solid geometry, which we refer to it as a lid. Flow simulation has some tools to automatically do that for you, but it's necessary not only to for it to find the fluid domain, like what we see here, but also to define the boundary conditions of how air is going to enter into your system or any fluid for that matter, right? 
So when lids are not required is typically when you're running an external analysis, of course. You don't need to necessarily figure out the fluid domain across some internal volume because it's just outside of your parts, right? So you may have to do some modeling pre-work before running an internal analysis, uh, in this case, defining the lids, okay? So uh, the first thing that I wanna talk about here is actually meshing. That's probably the, probably the most uh, important thing to really be aware of in terms of what's being used, how it's being calculated, and what are the general rules of thumb of creating a mesh. Right, and the nice thing about flow simulation is that it does an automatic measure, or it has an automatic measure, which really means that it takes into account, of course, the geometry, but also any potential boundary conditions that you throw at it. So, if you're selecting a certain face that has a, you know, a specific uh, inlet flow rate or whatever it may be, it's going to automatically try to refine as best as it can at a certain resolution. You know that that area where you're setting up that problem. And it actually does a pretty good job. Uh, the automatic measure for a baseline study is pretty good. You know, as far as getting a general first run to make sure that you've set up the problem correctly, make sure you didn't input something backwards or something like that. It does a pretty good job of, you know, running your study pretty efficiently and giving you decent results just because it's automatically refining that mesh in those general areas. But there are some general rules of thumb that we have in terms of if you are you know, trying to see the conduction through or account for conduction through a, a PCB, a thin plate, we usually want at least two to three elements, cube elements across that thickness of the geometry to be considered a good quality mesh. And we are able to run that, uh, take a look at the, the mesh quality and refine it accordingly, okay? And <clears throat> that's where that uh, fourth major bullet there, if you find that the mesh is not refined enough, you can incorporate local mesh options. So you're not tied to just the global settings. You can specifically say a certain region needs to have a higher quality. And in turn, that actually saves you on a little bit of calculation time, just because, again, you're narrowing the scope in terms of I want more refinement in a certain area versus globally for the entire model. So there's a lot of good flexibility, a lot of good manual tools that I'll show you here that we can do within, within Flux. So let me just show you in SolidWorks here. What we're going to be working through here is a little drone that we modeled up. And this is a good example of what the final design may look like. There is a lot of detail that's happening here, a lot of electronics components that are embedded within you know, the actual drone itself. And if we're starting off with maybe trying to see what the propeller design is doing, maybe that's the real focus of the drone itself, we can try to get rid of some of these details that are not really necessary, right? We want to just see the flow path of those things spinning, essentially. So we can dumb it down to a, conf a configuration like this, where that's where we leverage configurations, where we'll have the default, has all the full details, the final design, but we can leverage configs to suppress components that are not really necessary and only include what's really needed, right? So in this case, I'm really just focusing on this design or this propeller design here. And you see that I dumbed it down to is just the frame, the outside structure, and the blades itself, okay? So that's one example of how we can simplify this a bit. So after we activate that configuration, we simply can turn on flow simulation, which uh, as a reminder, you know, all our tools, usually all our tools here are integrated within SOLIDWORKS. Flow is no different. So you see, after I turn on the add-in, we're already in that interface. So what's beneficial about that is, again, if you are testing different blade designs, different angles, you can easily tie that into different configurations. And you can set up one baseline study, clone it, transfer those boundary conditions, and rerun it uh, without having to make any major adjustments. OK? So uh, in this case, we have a few different scenarios. You know, maybe not only am I just focused on the actual propellers here, but maybe you want to see the aerodynamics of what's happening within this model itself. And we can run all that through a basic external analysis. Now, when we start up a new project, we always go through this wizard process here. Right? So your natural reaction would be to hit that new icon, which you can. It creates a new project. 
but there's a lot of manual things that you have to define in the pre-setup where the wizard really takes you in a uh, step-by-step process of you choosing, enabling uh, what options you, or what boundary conditions you wanna consider within this project. So when we go through this process here, the first page that we see is naming the project. You see it's tied using that first configuration. When we proceed next, we can define the unit system. That's easy enough. What's actually kind of nice about this is that you can create your own. So notice, for instance, I don't want my velocity, let's say, for meters per second. Maybe we want it in terms of uh, you know, anything else like miles per hour. We can easily change that very easily. And if you find yourself customizing that a lot, then you can just enable create new, add your name to it, and it'll be saved within this database forever, essentially. Okay. Uh, in this case, we'll just leave it as the default. And this is where we start choosing the physics of what's being incorporated. You know, in this case, it's going to be an external analysis. We said we wanted to check for the aerodynamics of the external component and maybe the propellers. We can do it at the same time or we can do it separately. So if I wanted to just start off with seeing how air is going to travel, in this case, in the negative uh, Z direction, we can easily do that by just simply turning on external. These physical features here are not really going to be tied to that type of problem, right? Because the heat conduction, radiation, all that's tied to a thermal analysis, and we don't really want to consider that effect here. We may want to see how the velocity changes as a, verse, uh, as a function of time. By default, flow simulation considers a steady state problem. So we're really just seeing what the final result is going to be based on whatever inputs you have. But if you want to see how those results change as a function of time, we can easily turn on time dependent and specify how long that's, that's going to run for and what time step you want to save your results. So if you say you want to run it for six, 60 seconds and save it every two seconds, it's, you're going to get a result at 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, all the way to 60 seconds. So very simple to do. Uh, so in this case, we really just want to say that it's external. So when we proceed next here, this is where we define the what fluid we're going to uh, choose here. Previous page, yep. Mm -hmm. So all the this these options are really just intended to save on the number of mesh elements that are within your model. That let's say you have an enclosure, you have like a hollow box that. Flow simulation is going to recognize that that box is hollow. And if there's no boundary conditions defined, it sees it as a solid geometry, therefore saving you on mesh elements. Uh, they pretty much do the same thing. One is for an internal analysis. The other one is for external, typically. But uh, that's just a means to save on mesh elements. OK. So we get presented here with the fluids page. What fluid do we want to account for within this project? Seems pretty straightforward. It is. We have different categories here. You're probably going to be utilizing air for most of your cases. But we can go into the gas, select air here, and just add it to our project. Now, if I click New, we do have the opportunity to create our own custom fluid or even custom solids uh, or anything really that you see on this list that is relevant to whatever project you have. And every major category is uh, categorized by a predefined or user defined. Predefined is what flow simulation gives you from a fresh install. So if we look at air and look at the item properties, it's a function of the dynamic viscosity, specific heat, thermal conductivity. So those are the bare minimum uh, requirements for you to define just a normal gas. The nice thing about this, though, is when you do create your own, you can input a constant value. You know, let's say for connectivity, if you were doing a, a thermal project, but all of them from full flow simulation are table dependent, which you can do as well if you were to define your own custom one. And you see that for the connectivity, if we switch that to connectivity, there's a pretty large temperature range that you can pretty much associate to a specific connectivity. So we're making these properties a little bit more intelligent. So as the temperature potentially changes within you know, our components, the connectivity may change as well, and it's going to follow based on this table. Right? So it really depends on wh uh, what data you have, what testing you have done, that you can then utilize that. 
Okay. But um, in this case, we're just going to use the default error from flow, which we've just added. And then we can proceed forward to our setup here. There's nothing really here that's going to play a huge role. So we're just going to leave everything default. Uh, if you're doing an internal analysis uh, and there's texture on the internal walls that you want to account for, you can virtually define that or specify that within this parameter here. If not, it's going to assume that everything's just perfectly smooth. Everything's perfectly modeled in SOLIDWORKS. But if that really was a concern, you can input some sort of virtual roughness there where you don't have to model in or cat in those odd entities, which would drastically increase the solve time just because it's going to want to try to mesh on those weird little uh, extrusions that you may define. So might as well do it as a virtual. This case, for this specific example, doesn't really matter. And then we get presented to the last page here, the initial and ambient conditions. This is pretty much the starting point. This is what it's considering as far as its initial conditions. Um, again, since it's a steady state, you know, it's not really going to matter in terms of nothing's really changing as a function of time here or anything like that. So we can leave everything as default. However, if we wanted to do that example of really seeing the aerodynamics of the system, we really just look at the coordinate system that it's referring to here, which usually follows the global coordinate system from SOLIDWORKS down here. And we could just say error is traveling a certain direction, right? So in this case, if I wanted to go in the Z direction and say that it was going 25 uh, miles per hour, you see the arrow in which it wants to go in. So those visual cues really help uh, really understand what direction arrow wants to go. So in this case, we could just simply add a negative 25, it switches it, and that's what we want to account for. All right. So very simple to do kind of this external error effect. Right. Uh, when we proceed to finish, immediately it's going to throw you into, again, flow. But now you see the flow feature tree to set up the additional boundary conditions that you may see uh, that may be required within this project. But you see that the model is in this box. And that we refer to it as the computational domain. So really, whatever's inside that box, it's broken up into these small cells. Right? And every cell, it's doing math right? to figure out anything in terms of velocity, what your pressures are going to be, uh, what the force is acting onto those faces. Right? It's figuring out all those components. Now, um, depending on, you know, in this case, the way we understand how you know, air is going to travel in this direction, we want to see maybe the flow path right behind it. So we can adjust this as we see fit. We can kind of eyeball this. We just want to make sure that we give it enough room for the flow to actually do what it needs to do, right? Because if I make this computational domain very tiny or really close to the model, we're going to get a bad result. We're not going to get a realistic behavior of what that arrow wants to do. As far as air traveling in that direction here, we're not going to see a lot of information. So we want to make sure that we give it enough space to see what the, flu the fluid wants to do. And this is where you may need to take like an iterative approach where you may start simple, really small domain, see what those error profiles gonna look like, and then maybe increase the domain accordingly to account for more fluid behavior, essentially, All right? So um, in this case, you know, we can leave it as so. We do have techniques, however, to recognize the fact that our geometry is maybe symmetric things may be behaving axisymmetrically uh, depending on what we're looking at take advantage of that just because it's going to save you on calculation time but not only does the geometry have to be symmetric the boundary conditions have to be uh, behave symmetrically as well right so in this case if air is just traveling you know across this model in this direction there's no, no other factor that we're considering, we could probably get away with symmetry here. And that's where adjusting these components really, uh, the domain size really comes into play, where we can get the true measurement of what that width is, what the original domain is. For the purpose of this, we can simply just kind of eyeball it. You see it kind of snaps to the actual origin there. We could take advantage of resizing this 
And in the computational domain, we can edit that criteria. And for uh, the direction, I believe, along the X, so this one here, you see that once I click on this pull-down menu, I have the option here for symmetry, and you get the visual representation as far as that is being mirrored. Right. So right now we just cut the calculation time in half and we can make this quarter symmet uh, symmetry if it made sense to. Right. But in this case, we can resize it. And then when we get results, you'll see that we can mirror those results as well, because we would expect those results to be mirrored or be the same if we were to mirror it across that cutting plate. Right. So we can accept that there. We can actually hide this just to get the domain out of the way. But that's what it's accounting for there. And that's really it in terms of this general setup as far as air traveling across that model, as far as the boundary conditions go, okay? But I do want to talk about here uh, if and when you do create a flow simulation project, whether it's aero, whether it's electronic schooling, any flow project, I highly recommend always defining goals. Because at this point, I could run the analysis, take the default uh, mesh, but goals gives you the opportunity to call out the information that is relevant to you. And we can use that goal as a criteria for the solver to stop. So let's say if we didn't define goals, uh, what it's doing internally, it's if we look at the input data or right click on input data and go to calculation control options, it's taking into account the number of travels or iterations and sometimes since it's automatically figuring that out based on this criteria, maybe it doesn't run long enough for you to get a final result. So the results that you may get may not be as accurate if the study didn't run long enough, ultimately. So what goals allows to do is if I'm interested to see, let's say, you know, what the overall velocity is for the entire model or what the forces acting on these faces are, we can generate these goals and use that as a criteria where we can say, don't stop the solver until those values converge. And that's the game with any analysis is to make sure we have convergence, to make sure that, you know, assuming that our boundary conditions were set up correctly, that these results have been run long enough for those results to settle to a finite value. Okay. So some examples. Uh, so let me switch over here to my completed config here. Some examples that we can do to define a goal is looking at the overall air velocity. So if I right click on goals, you see that we have a few options. Global goals means the overall result for the entire system, the entire domain. It's not tied to a location or anything like that. It's the overall velocity. So if I select that, these are all the different parameters that are available. So you see, again, depending on what project you're trying to throw at it or what you're trying to solve, we can look at pressure. We can look at temperature of the fluid, temperature of the solid. Uh, you know, we can, again, look at the forces that are acting on specific faces. But these are just the overall results of the entire project. Now, we can get pretty specific by incorporating, like, a surface goal. So that's where, you know, I can select, you know, specific faces here. I want to know what the force is acting on the Z direction, the opposite Z direction. And then I can enable the force on the Z direction there. Maybe that was an interest of, I want to see how much drag there is for that, for that drum. Okay. And then um, you see we have the option to define a volume goal. So I'll talk about this again once we get into an electronics cooling example, but this is where if you were, there's a specific component that you want to get a result for to see how hot something was getting, you can choose volume to say, I want to know what the result is for this specific body, right? But what's not really nice about this tool here is we can define an equation goal. So based on these parent level goals that you've created, you can define equation relationships between them. So if you were just looking at a simple pipe where uh, you knew what the inlet flow rate was and what the outlet pressure is, and you want to see what the pressure difference is, you can create an equation to say, give me the pressure drop of the outlet pressure and whatever pressure you get in the inlet, right? So, uh, so anything that, you know, is a little bit more complex or something that uh, 
uh, you want to figure out that's a function of the primary results that you can get from flow, you can create an equation off of that so that it delivers that value. All right, so we can get pretty, pretty complex with what these goals are. So what I would recommend doing, though, since these, these goals are the results that are of interest to you, this is specifically what you're after, I would recommend going into the input data or right-clicking on input data, going to your calculation controls, and making sure that the criteria to stock is enabled for goal convergence. All right, so this is what that relationship is, is when a flow simulation is running, it keeps running until we see some results. Right. Or until those results converge, excuse me. Right. So let me show you an example of what information you get while it's solving. That's uh, very helpful here. Right. So um, I'm just going to clone this project. So once you define that, again, we don't have any additional, additional components. Uh, before I run, I can actually move straight to the run because there is an automatic measure. But what is taken into account here is when we go by default, it's going to set be set to automatic level three. That's generally a good starting point there. All right. So if I, uh, there is no real reset button. Uh, just be aware that the automatic, uh, it's always going to be level three. So whenever you create a new project, is just it's always level three and this little this value here this minimum gap size that's always if you don't click on it or anything like that if you disable it it's always going to be kind of reset to the global model so um unfortunately there is no reset button here if you've messed with it but uh we'll talk about that here a little bit more but i just want to show you in terms of those goals what you can do is you can monitor you know what those results are actually doing in real time and you can't really do this with the fea portion if you use that tool and this becomes very helpful because it allows you to see the results in real time to make sure that you haven't made any mistakes essentially so what you get is the secondary window here which is the solver window by default you'll get this info pretty much is going to tell you how many mesh elements you get and it's going to log every major thing that it has completed you know the mesh uh you know actually solving and then eventually we'll be able to track those specific goals that we want right so in this case it wants to define the mesh so just give it a a few seconds here <clears throat> So you see that after it completes the mesh, it tells you that for this model, for that specific setting, which I did dumb it down to a, a level one, uh, it's creating 58,000 cells. You know, So uh, it's just kind of letting you know how many cells there are. And if we're going into the hundreds of thousands or millions, that's a lot. So if you're really running as a, just a baseline study, you probably want to dumb that resolution down a bit. But after it starts calculating, some of these options up top wake up, like the checkered flag, the graph, this contour plot here. Uh, the checkered flag is really tied to your goals. So you can see what the current value is, and this thing won't stop until that those values have converged. And if you want to see an actual graph tied to that, I actually prefer using the second icon, which is the insert goal plot, which will still give you that numeric information. But if we enable both, we get a graph kind of showing us, you know, it trying to converge. So um, the other thing that we can do as well is we can insert a contour plot. So I'm going to switch this, I believe. Sure, let's keep it at the right plane. Maybe you want to look at uh, velocity here. And when we hit OK, um, look, okay, let's switch it to the other plane here. So you see that. We're not getting the results from this. This is just the solver window. This is just to be able to track what's happening. So if you want to update you know, the plane direction, you can right click on the window, go to properties, say now I want to reference the, the secondary plane here. So when we hit OK, you see what's going on. 
right? So how I would utilize this is if you see that the results are already kind of funny or don't really seem to make sense, you could just kill the solver and you don't have to wait until the very end to kind of find out you made a mistake, you know, versus what you would probably do with FEA. FEA, you kind of just mesh it, run it, and then, oh man, I did it in the wrong direction. So utilize this as best as you can. These are the two things that I really track in terms of while well, solving is looking at the goals if you created any and see you know how it's progressing. So this is, you know, and this is another way of controlling solve time, you know, because if you leave things as automatic, who really know? I mean, I don't really, I can't really tell you what flow simulation is going to dictate in terms of what is trying to calculate for it, because there's a lot of different things, a lot of different data that you can get from a flow study with the goals it narrows down, it narrows down the scope. And essentially you're getting what you need and not having flow try to figure that out for you or trying to figure out a whole bunch of other things that you don't really care about. All right. Good so far, at least for the, yep. Just wind hitting an object? Oh, sure. Uh, yes. So the question was for the for the people online. Uh, the question was, can I define a different wind load or wind velocity at a different portion of the model, right? So if you're looking at a building, it's higher at top, lower on the bottom. Uh, you, so when you define, when you enable the external, it's really just global uh, from what we saw here. Now, if you wanted to do that, you would need to define two dummy solids to say that velocity or airflow is coming in from this region of the model, like some region that kind of dictates the portion of the model and then define another flow rate for the secondary model. So you need some dummy solid to say that air is coming out of a certain direction at different areas of the. Exactly, right, some some dummy solids there. Um, yeah, because yeah, the, the, the global settings there is really just saying that entire domain is seeing a, a uniform velocity. So we, we need to break that up into different sections. Now, what you could do is if you are able to convert that into some sort of expression or some sort of equation, you can then input that equation as a dependency at the global level. So uh, when we go into our general settings, you'll notice that uh, when we define, and that's where we need to probably need to turn on like a transient analysis as well, as far as it being time dependent. But whenever you see this, the, the word dependency here, uh, or if you can still see it in your boundary condition, so wherever you define some sort of boundary condition, you can make some parameter dependent. So you can click on that icon and you can input some sort of uh, for formula definition, some sort of expression that uh, may be tied to you know, something similar to what you described if you can get an equation off of that, if you can create an equation off of that, essentially. So a couple ways to really define that. The easiest way or the more direct way is creating the demi solids and varying that, that velocity. Quick question on the, on the symmetry. Uh, mm -hmm. Will the results that it spits out be for half the model or will it just be? So, yeah, so it's just going to be based on whatever, or this half here. And then but when... So the recommend, uh, yes, ultimately. So when you define boundary conditions, <clears throat> you know, if you were to incorporate some sort of force value, you would cut that value in half. Pressure, that's not really gonna matter. It's per unit area, right? So ultimately though, if you wanted to see the, the forces on this case, we would double it. Yeah, we, we would divide it by two, yeah. As far as the visual uh, input or the visual that you can get, you can easily like mirror those plots, but ultimately you would need to double that value. Yeah. Okay, so for this case, uh, once we get some results here, 
you know, we can, the most, the way we extract results, they're either just cutting slices of the model or looking at specific information off of face. Uh, the first one here I usually like doing is a, inserting a cut plot. It's really just taking in your normal SOLIDWORKS planes or any additional planes that you've created to cut the model in any specific direction and get some type of result. So here, I really want to cut it along this direction to see what's happening, you know, if I were to view it like what we see here. And then I can turn on the contour. So I would switch this plane to kind of this right plane, which is what we see here is going to cut it along where we split it. It's always going to default to contours, which is giving us that rainbow colored plot. We can turn on vectors or overlay it with vectors to make sure the direction of error is going in the right direction. Switch our plot here to whatever's relevant, in this case, velocity. And when we hit OK, you know, we get the overall result in terms of, you know, what the error wants to do. We take a look at the vectors. That looks good. And we see that we essentially gave it enough room on this back end to see what the fluid profile is going to look like, right? So that's where you kind of make sense of you don't want these boundary conditions to be too tight to the point where, you know, really close to the end of that blade, because there's a, a lot of different velocity things that are happening or a lot of different profiles that are, how it's changing as it's going along the actual model, right? So that's where kind of eyeballing it or adjusting it to where you see the most fluid behavior is gonna happen, you adjust it accordingly there, okay? The other thing here is now kind of going into meshing, Let's take a look at what that mesh looks like. Oops, wrong plot. So let me show you this plot again. So I've overlaid the mesh with the actual contour, OK? And this is what the default mesher. And the way I like to think about things, is, especially with an external analysis like this, there's a lot of pockets or a lot of region where you see my cursor moving here that probably are not going to see a lot of fluid activity, right? So the Atomac Mesher did a good job of coursing it up in the areas where it's probably not going to need a high resolution. So it automatically refined the mesh kind of on the exterior faces of your components, right? But you see this pocket here, there is some, you know, activity happening there at this contour. So how could we refine the mesh in that general area? you know, with our settings. Well, there's a couple ways we can do that. So with the global settings here, so if I create or if I define this global setting, utilizing the automatic, you'll always see that it's defaulted to a level three. That's a good starting point there. Again, it's taking into account the geometry, any boundary conditions that you apply, and it'll automatically refine you get something similar to this, right? With the manual settings, however, Oh, I guess a little bit more on this automatic here. Uh, for this, uh, at least for for the sake of visual here, uh, settings one through three is usually good for like a what if, very baseline, really setting up a new project to see, you know, how well your or you know if you set up your boundary conditions correctly. Setting the resolution up to four or five is a good kind of final stance there. Anything above that, and depending on what version you're in, you know, you can go up to eight, but I think now moving with, with 2019 or 2018, it goes up to seven. That's going to give you a more, more precise answer, sure. But the gain that you get from that is probably not going to be that different if you were to compare it with the level four or five, right? So usually you want to stay within that range if you want to keep it at the automatic settings, right? But again, usually recommend changing these things manually, focusing the attention to wherever the model, uh, wherever, you know, it should be. So in this case, this question. Yeah, so for, if you wanted, um, unfortunately, no. So flow simulation is only tied to a cube or, you know, or a rectangle or, or whatever it may be, a six-sided element, essentially. We can reduce, you know, you kind of see here, it went from like these rectangular shape, if you will, to just a regular square. 
that is dictated just based on the mesh refinement. You know, you see that automatically it broke it down into these smaller chunks, but flow simulation doesn't account for tetrahedral shapes like you normally would through an FEA, mainly because flow simulation uses the fluid volume method, which really means that it not only is accounting for the fluid domain, like everything that's just air, but it's also the interaction between the air and the solid. So we're limited to just that cube-like cell, if you will. This first, this first um, iteration here was the global automatic measure. So the automatic meshing uh, did that. It, it takes into account these details and it's understanding that air is hitting that wall and it always refines the mesh kind of on the exterior walls of your components, whether it's a channel or, you know, what you see here. So is there a display thing that a display thing. So what you want to do is the, how I'm seeing this plot is when you right click a cut plot at whatever direction, you want to overlay it with the mesh and that should give you the mesh output. Just make sure you're on a correct cutting plane. And it could be that the mesh is just really coarse. Only after the calculation. Yeah. And you have to mesh it first. You have to kind of run through. So you notice that when I run this study, you see that I have the option to actually mesh and run. I do have the option to just mesh it, right? So when you create your cup plot, whatever plane you're referencing, you can enable just the mesh here and you should see like this grid mapping. I see the grid, I just, mine just doesn't track the down. Okay, well, we can we could try to look at it uh, after here, yeah. Again, it should automatically refine the mesh, and it's dependent on a lot of fact or a few factors. The geometry, if it's thin, it's also dependent on any additional boundary conditions that you've applied. Uh, but ultimately, if you wanted to refine the mesh in a global sense, we can go into the manual settings, and in the refining cells section here, the top bar is the, the refinement of the fluid cells, so only. So if you wanted to refine the cells of all these global or the entire global region here of just the fluid domain, you can by just incrementally adding up the or increasing the marker. And then you have the option here to refine the mesh for this fluid solid boundary. So if you wanted to remesh it on your end, I would probably want to increase this bar here. Uh, you know, maybe a level one to see what that does. It should refine the mesh within that boundary of the solid and the fluid. Okay. So those are the two that I really spend a lot of my time in, in terms of adding refinement. So I would start simple in terms of just seeing what a level one does, seeing how refined the mesh is, because again, depending on the size, that may drastically increase your mesh count. These break up the cells even further, right? So it's splitting up the cells even further. So it's making those values smaller, right? Now, um, on a related note, a new functionality came out in, I think, 2016 or so. We can incorporate here. So when we look at our global mesh settings here, when we scroll down, we have the option here to, uh, where are you? Oh, we have the option to define a local mesh. So insert local mesh means that we can refine the mesh in an isolated area, a specific face, right? And you see that with the selector box, we can select a component, a face, a vertex, right? To apply this refined mesh. What I showed you before with the manual, uh, we have those same options, but now we're saying we're refining it at that local location. So before 
all we really saw was just some very basic refinement on the actual outside faces of the model. But if I wanted to refine the regions or the pockets that are kind of out of that model, we can turn on this option here, this equidistant refinement. And this pull down menu really tells you or allows you to control how many zones or how many pockets outside of your geometry you want to refine. So here, what I did was I selected the three exterior faces of my model and I wanted to refine it up to two zones, right? Two pockets in front of that, those faces that I wanted to refine. And then from there, I can increase, you know, that the, the marker here to level three. And that really just means how many times it's going to refine the mesh. So we can increase that marker. And when we look at the mesh here, you see what that option is really doing is it's a means of getting this level of refinement without including any like dummy solid or anything like that. Those two zones that we're talking about was this zone here and then the second zone here. So as it gets further out to the to the ambient space, it got a little bit more coarse. But by us increasing that marker and saying that I wanted to mesh the refinement up to those two zones, we can get a finer resolution within that model here. Right. So that would probably be the easiest way if you did have this arrow type of uh, analysis. The other thing that you can do as well is if there was an arbitrary location, some random portion, you can incorporate a dummy solid and refine that dummy solid within that pocket, right? So I don't really have that example here, but ultimately, again, keep in mind that when you define that local mesh, you can reference a component. So let's say you just did a random block in the front of this and you wanted to refine that region that that block is accounting for. We can add that level of mesh refinement and when we go into right-clicking input data and going to uh, component control, we can eliminate that body from the analysis, right? So we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about the propellers and rotating region, but we can exclude these dummy solids, but still use them as a reference to get results or to even refine the mesh in those random spaces, right? So it really depends on, on what you're trying to refine there. So if you're dealing with something a little bit more complicated, I probably would stay away from adjusting the global settings because it's going to refine everything. Take advantage of the local refinement. You, there's a lot of options there to really narrow down that scope. Okay. The other thing here is, let me look at uh, another example. In terms of notice, that for my frame, there's these thin slots. So maybe you're dealing with like a sheet metal box you're dealing with like an electronics enclosure, you model to include those boxes, maybe they're gonna be welded, but you just leave some sort of clearance. You can exclude those slots in the mesh so that it automatically closes them up for you, where you don't have to incorporate more 3D features or actually make those bodies overlap. And very simple to do where we can, in the global mesh setting, we have this option here to, closed thin slots. So in the global mesh setting, we have this closed thin slots and you input this maximum height of slots to close. So whatever that uh, slot value is, you input that, it's going to detect that in the mesh. So if you enable that, what you would expect is, you know, some, maybe some automatic mesh refinement within that region. But if we turn on that closed thin slots, it essentially ignores it. And we don't have to worry about really closing it up with the actual physical model. So if I load this up here and show you what I'm referring to, notice that there is no mesh elements when we enable that. It's essentially clear. And if I hide my model, it pretty much saw it as a solid component. So it's a nice way of not having to add that extra level of, of uh, feature within your CAD flow simulation can eliminate that for you, okay? So a lot of, a lot of good options there to manipulate your, your mesh, okay? All right, so let's talk about here rotating region. 
or the now focusing on here, the propeller design. So there are really three types of ways we can define this, this project or define that, that specific application. So we need to enable that rotating region option when we were in the wizard. And you really have three types. One is a global rotation, a local region, or a local region sliding mesh, right? So the global rotation really assumes that whatever geometry is there, whatever geometry you threw at it, the entire geometry, the entire system is actually rotating, right? So it's a nice way of just saying this whole thing is just rotating and we get some results from that. But of course, when we look at the drone here, not the entire drone is not rotating as just those propellers, of course, right? So to minimize calculation, we can narrow down where that local region is by defining that option. And it's intended for that specific case where the uh, specific region is rotating, where the connected bodies are not rotating. So you're probably going to be living within that option there if you had a similar application, you know, like this, right? Where there's only a certain thing that's rotating here. Now, but the thing to keep in mind here is that the, you know, there are some benefits. It's faster because you're, you know, focusing on a specific region. But the assumption here is that the flow would enter and leave in an axisymmetric manner, right? So if there, if it's not behaving axisymmetrically, then we have to default here to the sliding mesh component, right? So just imagine like some sort of like turbine, some blower, right? Uh, uh, the, the impeller or the blades that are actually spinning is not, the airflow is not moving or is not uh, in an environment where it's behaving axisymmetrically, we would have to incorporate the sliding mesh where it's literally making the mesh moves uh, move as it rotates, which is why we have to incorporate a transient analysis and therefore it increases the solve time. But it's a means of when you have a non-axisymmetric flow scenario, it, we utilize that option, right? In this case here, I just defined a local region and I said that air would enter or pretty much behave in an axisymmetric manner. And what you need to know in terms of setting up that problem is you need to incorporate some dummy geometry that specifies the region of where those blades live. So what I don't have shown here, which I have hidden, is that I created these components that are pretty much encompassing the entire blade. So we need to do just a simple extrusion that accounts for that flow path or the, the blades rotating. And then in flow, we say that that's the region, that dummy solid is the region in which it is moving, right, rotating. So when we enable that, so when we account for that here, in flow simulation, when you go through your wizard process, all we really turned on was just we still kept it as external analysis, and we left it as this local region averaging. So when I click on the pull down, you see the three options that I just discussed here. So the local region averaging means that it's this axisymmetric case. The local region sliding is that sliding mesh global rotating. Rotating means the entire model is rotating, right? So that's all we really have to enable there. So when you enable that, you get this rotating region section. So when we add uh, an actual rotating region, we grab the actual component, the physical geometry here, and you see what direction this thing wants to spin. You input, you know, whatever unit system you're in. In this case, we can say like negative 2000 or whatever it may be, RPM. All right, and then you see that it switched the arrow. So whatever direction it needs to go in, of course. But right now, Flow thinks that that body needs to be or is included within the analysis, which doesn't really make sense. So we need to go back into our input data and go to co uh, component control options. And you see that those two rotating regions or those two components that account for those two propellers, they're not necessarily included in the results or in the analysis. It's just referencing that body for us to define that rotation, to be able to define this boundary condition here. OK, so that's all we have to do in terms of the prep work as far as adding that dummy geometry.
okay? And when we do that, we can, you know, run the analysis like we normally would. And then we can output a cut plot, which, you know, shows us, you know, depending on where we want to slice it, uh, you know, the overall velocity, the vectors and all that, and the streamline. So let me show you another one here. Oh, that's that direction here. So we can start there. We can see through the vectors that it's following the direction that I would want to you know, rotate, essentially. What I want to, what you want to make sure to do, especially when you start creating more than one cut plot or any plot for that matter, when you generate a new one, make sure you reset the upper boundary and the lower boundary to the actual plot image. So what I mean is when I click on the upper bound, the first icon here is to reset to global maximum. So that saying is that globally for the entire model, it has some global velocity. But I want to see what the global velocity or what the max velocity is for just that plot that we've created. So I want to make sure that this has reset to that value. And you see that sometimes you need to make that manual adjustment. That is now it's showing me the, the real range within that cut slice, within that region. All right. So we can get that, uh, you know, pretty much whatever direction we specify there within the plane. We can view that. Uh, let me show you the other direction here. So let me hide this. All right, so let me just reset that here a bit. And, you know, we get the general idea of, you know, based on the directions that it wants to, to go down off, but ultimately we see that due to that blade design, it's giving us some level of velocity there, right? And then at that point, you can clone this project, tie it to another design, uh, or, you know, change the speed a bit and see how those results change. Let me just show you this point of view. So what I'm showing you here is that when we end, create a new plot, and since we did use symmetry, we can simply en enable this option here, mirror result, simply just mirrors that result. Uh, and this is what we would expect to see if we were to run the entire model. Okay, so we get that effect. And you see that not only did I enable the, the vectors, but I enabled uh, streamlines. So it was that fourth option or whatever. Yeah, the fourth option here. And this is a nice display to see ultimately where there's going to be any recirculation that's happening again at that cut plane. All right, so you see that there's some recirculation happening at these ends here. Okay. So a lot of nice display options that we can just simply enable. Yeah, so let me hide this. We do have animation tools. Uh, most likely you would want to do like some sort of flow trajectory. So really see how those vectors dynamically moving. And that automatically gives you like an animation. So you see that once it generates those vectors, we can kind of see what's what's happening there. And we can select more faces to give us more vectors in those regions. Uh, but ultimately, we just grab the the two bodies that represent the the rotating region. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So. Yeah, and, and that's really the whole uh, point behind it is being able to change the angle, the way it's swept. Even though you don't physically see that thing rotating, it is taking into account that geometry. All right, so that's the, the important part, of course, right? So at that point, if you want to see what it did changing the angle, you had a configuration tied to that, you would simply could clone that project tie it to any secondary config that makes that angle change, rerun the analysis, and that's it, right? There's a lot of, not a lot of stuff that you would need to change after that. No, it's, it's dependent on the shape of that, that blade. So you, you, you definitely need to include that. Yeah, question. So instead of 
in flow simulation, we can't, we can't see things move. Uh, there's no dynamic movement there. Uh, that is not an option. That's just kind of the way flow built it that way. It's just, it's this area, this, this area where, because the propellers could be multiple ones. It's just saying that it's this local region that it's meshing and refining the mesh versus it just doesn't give it the option to select specific faces. Is that what you're kind of asking? Yes, sir. Instead of saying just a region or a dummy solid, just literally select the blades. Yeah, unfortunately, it's just tied to this is the area in which it's rotating, right? Since we can't have flow simulation dynamically change the position. More or less, yeah, ultimately, yeah. No. Right, exactly. So you could get the you know what the air forces are on that but you won't see any level of deformation or anything like that we we can't see things deform or change shape or move in flow it's just kind of uh for the most part stationary but since obviously these propellers are moving in real life we say that that region is rotating within that taking into account the shape and that's why we can't really necessarily say just the individual faces are rotating because we don't physically see that thing rotate, right? So, okay, but, um, you know, luckily, or I say luckily because it's, it's not really much beyond that. You know, it's really just throwing in that cylindrical body, that region, whatever the height, whatever the thickness is, and then inputting uh, what RPM that thing is spinning, right? Um, so not a lot of pre-work that you have to do, but again, uh, you know, for a similar situation, which I'm sure that's what you guys are doing, you'll probably do that local rotating region. That sliding mesh is more so, again, when you have a non-axisymmetric uh, fluid behavior, some sort of like engine turbo, if you will, or a blower fan or whatever, uh, where that air is not really spinning in or out in an axisymmetric way. It's, you know, maybe traveling through a certain non-axisymmetric path, let's say that's where the results get a little funny or get a little uh, or diminish just because it's not behaving that axiometric manner, which is what classifies the sliding mesh. Okay. Um, and that's essentially it in terms of the fluid rotating region aspect of this here. Uh, I think uh, now, unless there's any other questions on this, it's a good portion to switch over and talk about the electronics cooling add-on that you guys have as far as what that brings to the table. Uh, right, that was the second part, right, Lars, as far as what you guys wanted to see? Okay. So with that thermal K, with the, any thermal application, you can use core flow simulation, right? But what the electronics cooling add-on provides is just a little bit more uh, accuracy in your definition in terms of, you know, if you fall into one of these categories here. So the, the main one here is the PCB generator. Now, uh, let me pull up uh, another example here real quick. Oops, I think I have it here actually. So, you know, very generalized electronics box. I just hid the cover. I just want to point out, though, that when we talk about model simplification, this is like what I mean. You see that we have, you know, we have just the general shapes, the actual positioning, the location of where these components are located. That's what we want. You know, if we start having or throwing in some some sketch uh, cuts or, you know, any any like fine details, that, you know, who, who knows, you know, some scribed kind of letters onto the components or anything like that. Flow simulation is going to want to refine the mesh in those little small thicknesses. And for what? You know, that's not really going to add to anything. We just need the overall general shape here. All right. So it's a nice example of showing model simplification. 
But the first one here, as far as what you get with this electronics cooling add-on, which you do have four seats of uh, on the network, for one, or excuse me, three seats on the network that you can utilize this tool. But the first one here is being able to define a little bit more accurately the connectivity of a board, okay? Because a board is made up of different layers, has copper coverage, so the connectivity may differ or you know will be slightly different depending on what the copper coverage is. So with core flow simulation, without the add-on, what how we would define that is we incorporate by adding some sort of normal solid material. So when we incorporate a solid material here, we just pick up on that board. And the assumption here is that whatever material that we define, so if we choose one from the default uh, database, you know, there's a three of them there, four layer, 12 layer, eight layer. And the way SOLIDWORKS define that is the properties that are tied to this specific material here is more like an equivalent connectivity or an equivalent material that makes up this block, right? Because notice the block wasn't modeled in a way where we actually have different layers. It's just a block, right? So the way or the, the what options we have with core flow is being able to define either assume that the conductivity, the properties are going to behave in an isometric or isotropic manner meaning that it's going to be the same in terms of X, Y, and Z, or we can define it in a, as an orthotropic condition where uh, if I were to kind of create my own here, you see, if I go to orthotropic, we can define the conductivity in terms of X, Y, and Z. So whatever data that you have, you know, that you want to make it a little bit more realistic, we can incorporate that definition. But again, that's assuming that the these values are more of an equivalent value to what make up those four layers of this board. Now, that's what we can do with core flow. Now, none of this information within the normal database gives us or gives us the opportunity to define how many layers there are, what the thickness of those layers are, what the copper coverage is. That's where the electronics cooling module comes into play. So you will get this printed circuit board option here. And when you define that, We, have, we had created a custom one here, and when we edit that to see what it's made up of, you see we can define essentially the following information, right? Uh, the normal specific heat, the material conductivity here, but more so, you can tie in these gray values are essentially generated for you in a sense where you just define, or as far as a user input, you define how many layers there are, what the thickness of those layers are, and what the overall percentage of that copper coverage. You can't really say what the trace of that copper is. You really just assume what, how much it's covering that specific layer. From this definition, you're going to get a more accurate connectivity resolution within that material, right? So versus just saying that this block is made up of some material, right? So we get a little bit more detail there, and really the main benefit is you're getting a more realistic answer for the board itself, okay? So that's really the, the main thing there with the PCB, uh, PCB generator, okay? Uh, the other thing that we have here is a two-resistor model. So if you're dealing with a two-resistor component, pretty much you look at this, we have the board, we have, you know, the casing of the chip, let's say, and we don't necessarily model that within the CAD geometry, right? Just because there's a lot of detail there. We can get away with just defining some sort of block or, you know, whatever represents this two resistor that's attached to a chip, that's attached to a heat sink. And we can define what that junction resistance is, that essentially there is some thermal resistance, resistance traveling through the board to the junction to the case, that's going to change. That may have a factor in terms of what the thermal distribution is where we don't necessarily need to model in that fine detail. It can just be a block underneath the, on top of a chip, and then we have like a heat sink tied, uh, tied to it, right? So we define what the resistance values are of those connection points. 
So that's another thing that we can do with the EC module, right? We can't really easily define that without incorporating more CAD geometries if we didn't have this, right? Here we can dumb down the, the model into just a simple box, a simple block that you connect it to, okay? Um, the electronics cooling module also allows you to do any heat pipes uh, that you may have incorporated within your analysis here. So an example of that is really simple to define. So we have a heat pipe where we're saying we want to extract heat from this chip to force it to go to this heat sink. Same thing with this chip here, right? We can't easily define being able to say that we're forcing heat from one area of the model to the other in, as a means of a heat pipe. But what we need to do is, you know, obviously have the 3D CAD representation of that heat pipe. And we just define, select the component what's representing that heat pipe. We then say what the heat in phase, so where we're trying to extract the heat from, and where we're trying to dissipate the heat, so that we're trying to dissipate the heat at the connection point or where that heat sink is. And then we just input some sort of thermal resistance. Again, the resistance between the connection point of the heat pipe to, let's say, the chip. From there, it's running the math to figure out you know, what is, you know, how much heat is going to pull off of the volume of that heat pipe and then ultimately due to that heat sink configuration, right? There's no real easy way to define that without having this module. And all we really need to know is what that thermal resistance value is. Okay, so, um, you know, again, very, very simple, not very complicated as far as what we're adding to this here. And then the last one is joule heating. So obviously there's electrical current running through your system and that's uh, a function of some sort of heat source. You may not know what that heat power is or how hot that current that's running through your system is. So it's utilizing here uh, where you, you know, if we were to look at this fuse model to put it simply, we have some current going in, we have some current going out, or we can say that there is some voltage going in and out. From there, it's back calculating to figure out some sort of heat power. So you get a finer resolution or more realistic uh, input in terms of how much heat that's generating versus me guessing what that heat power is or how much temperature, a specific region of where the current is running, All right? So it's a nice way to literally just say that there is current or voltage running through a path and it gives you temperature. And that's really it. There's not much beyond that in terms of the module. It's not giving you a completely separate tool it's utilizing your core flow simulation to add an extra level resolution here. So, you know, use it where you see fit. Probably what you're going to be spending a lot of time in is probably with that PCB generator. If there's any heat pipes incorporated within your enclosures, there's that added benefit there as well. Um, and then, yeah, so, and then you do have the option here for visual heating as well. All right, so after you enable those or there's not, nothing separate you need to turn on once you check out a license you know and that license is available or that part of the module is available it should already be within your flow system the best way to really uh determine whether you have uh that you've actually checked out a license of the electronics module or the electronics cooling module is when you go into your engineering database here what you should see is components that or the the best way is you should see a category that says two resistor component that is a function of your electronics cooling module if you don't see that then you may not have checked out that license or you know you may not have access to that so just kind of uh, there's no real indicator to show you that you have that or not aside from this okay so question yeah I believe so, um, but yeah, pretty sure. Um, as far as what I saw, that shouldn't really change, or or we would be able to see that for sure. Yeah. So, is that helpful? Any questions with that? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we had uh, here. Uh, 
you know, really drag coefficient is just going to be the force acting normal to the face. Oh, yeah, sorry. So the question was, uh, can we, if you had a complex shape, really for any shape, how can we get the drag coefficient? We can easily do that. That's what we had defined here, which is really just creating a surface goal. We can look at, select the faces in which we want to, we would expect to see that force acting on. Right, so maybe like these faces here, this is your complex shape, right? And then at this point, it's just looking at you know the force acting in that direction. So in this case, the vector would be the z direction here. We would just enable that. That is our actually our drag, uh, our our drag. So and then as far as a drag coefficient, we can also incorporate some sort of equation base if there is you know a little bit more to it, a little bit more. Uh, boundaries that you wanted to account for, you can use this value to create some sort of coefficient value through an equation base. Exactly. So to back calculate to the actual coefficient value. Here, we can use just the, the drag force as a reference to create an equation goal. Right. So, And that is, uh, that is one example that is shown in, in the training as well as creating that equation to to figure out the that value yeah. else there? yeah so i mean again we can spend some time uh after the fact here if you like if you want to look at something but ultimately that's what i had prepared for you there so hopefully you guys found that helpful especially with the mesh component that's the one that i really like to stress the most because that's universal that is you can apply that to a rotating region arrow internal ec those are kind of the what you need to look out for um, as far as the different options that you have available to you okay so yeah hope that was great <laughs> yep Thank you, Sylvia. We're going to turn the meeting off here. We'll have another one of these seminars coming up next month. So watch our calendar. And thanks, everybody, for coming.